بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وأصحاب سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا حبيب الله We're going to begin today's session, inshallah, by discussing some details about the life of the Honorable Father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Abdullah Radiallahu Ta'ala. There's no father in humanity more honorable by association then Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala he had the honor of being father to the greatest creation of Allah subhanahu ta'ala the Imam and leader of all the Anbiya, the Prophets and the Messengers and the last and final Messenger of Allah subhanahu ta'ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He was the youngest son of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, who we spoke about last time in the last two sessions, the Prophet Wasallam's grandfather. And his father, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he'd made an oath and taken a pledge that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him ten sons who were all healthy and all grew up to age of maturity he would in honor of this blessing he would sacrifice one of his sons um, and this is something that came true with Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala and he was the tenth son of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and when he grew to an age of around 18 or 20 um, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib then began to feel that he should honor this pledge that he made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this was his youngest son and with him having reached the age of maturity and being of sound health his pledge uh, had now uh, or would now be required to be fulfilled. And so he called all of his children and he held a, a meeting with all of his children. And you'll see many similarities between this and between uh, the instruction of the sacrifice and then what uh, followed um, with Sayyidina Ibrahim and Sayyidina Ismail and that he also, when he saw in his dream um, that he was sacrificing his son, he called his son and he asked him, he said, what do you think we should do? And so in the same way, um, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he gathered all of his children because he hadn't, he hadn't specified which one of them uh, would be sacrificed. His pledge was simply that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him ten sons, he would sacrifice one of them. So it could have been any one of them. And so he uh, gathered all of his children and he told them about this pledge that he'd made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said that now I feel it is time that that pledge ought to be fulfilled and all of his children um, they accepted this and they said 
uh, whatever you decide, whichever one of us you decide, um, with we will all um, honor your pledge and we will happily accept whatever decision you make. And so, it was decided that uh, they would draw lots near the Kaaba. And so, they went and they had something with each of the names of all ten of his sons and lots were drawn and it was the name of Sayyidina Abdullah that was, uh, that was drawn. All of his children were, you know, they were exemplary in every way, most handsome and intelligent and you know, good-natured and in terms of their conduct and uh, and so on. And however, you know, or truly only a father um, could maybe try, you know, maybe try to understand this situation and how huge this sacrifice actually was. This was a pledge that Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib had made himself. Perhaps no one even knew about this and he needn't tell any of his children but because this was something that he'd, it was a pledge that he'd made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, the, his strength of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be seen from this then he felt it was necessary for him to fulfill that pledge and this is something which is uh, narrated in um, poetry in uh, a few lines of poetry that he was reciting at the time and he said ahadtuhu wa ana mufin ahda that i have made this pledge and i am someone who honors and fulfills my oaths and pledges wallahi la yahmidu shay'un hamda and he says that uh, <coughs> there is no one and nothing that is praised in the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praised. إِذَا كَانَ مَوْلَايَ وَأَنَا عَبْدُ And it is that he is my mawla, he is my master, and I am his servant, وَأَنَا عَبْدُ نَزَرْتُ نَزْرًا لَا أُحِبُّ رَدَّ And I have made a pledge with him with sincerity which I do not wish to forsake. وَلَا أُحِبُّ أَنْ أَعِيشَ بَعْدًا And so, uh, if I don't fulfill this pledge, then I have no wish to live on. This is how determined he was, this was his resolve and determination to fulfill that pledge that he made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, you can take this as, a, uh, as an example of the strength of uh, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Sayyidina. Abdul Muttalib. And so, um, as I said, they drew lots and lots were drawn and Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala his name was, was drawn. And it is also true that he was most beloved to his father Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib of all of his children. However, this was a matter between him and his, his Lord, between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so no love, no matter how great and how sincere, how deep an affection was going to come in between this pledge that he made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he's determined that he will, he will make this sacrifice. A knife, a sharpened blade is brought to him and he's raising his sleeves, readying himself to slaughter, 
to sacrifice his son. And this news suddenly, like a flash of lightning, spreads through the city of Mecca. And when everyone finds out, all the leaders of the Quraysh, they all come to see Abdul Muttalib and they beg and plead with him to not do this. And they try to uh, remind him, you know, uh, that look at look at this son of yours. Uh, look at this. Look at his his beauty and his um, his his intellect. Look at his superior morals and conduct. You know, how can you sacrifice? How can you slaughter a child like this? And they said, we're not going to let you do this. Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he said, this is a matter between me and my God. It has nothing to do with you. And there is nothing that will stand between me and fulfilling my pledge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so then, when they see this elderly father's resolve, to do this, uh, to carry out this, they, they, they try a different tactic and they say, you know, what's go- why are you laying down, why are you laying down the foundation and the path for a trend in our culture, which if you do this, if a noble leader like you, someone who's respected universally, by all of us, someone who's held in such high regard and esteem was to do this, then surely this will become a trend. And we will, you know, we will have people slaughtering their sons and their children. And have mercy on those children. Again, you know, the response is the same. That this is a matter between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have made this pledge and I will fulfill this pledge. And so, however, after much sort of uh, to, to arguing to and fro and sort of arguments from both sides, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib remaining firm and the leaders of the Quraysh trying to convince him, eventually they decide that they will go to see a uh, soothsayer in uh, in Khaybar, just outside of what we uh, what is now referred to as Medina to Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam at that time was referred to as Yathrib, and so they all gather and they go to see uh, this individual. When they arrive there, um, they're told to wait and that they will be given their answer the following day. So the following day, they all go together and a suggestion is made. The answer that they're given is that they are asked, what is the penalty, the financial uh, penalty or the compensation, if you like, financial compensation for a deceased person or for killing somebody. What's the financial penalty? And they're told that it is uh, ten camels, that the person must give ten camels to the relatives of the deceased. And so that is considered to be the financial equivalent of taking someone's life. And so the suggestion is given that you draw lots again. This time there's only two. On the one hand you have Sayyidina Abdullah's name, on the other hand you have ten camels. And if that's not, you know, if Sayyidina Abdullah's name is drawn, then add another ten camels. And again if need be, repeat the process until such time as the lot is drawn uh, in the name of the camels rather than Sayyidina Abdullah. And so they all accept this decision and return to uh, Makkah Mukarramah and they arrange for these lots to be drawn. And so first time round it's drawn in the name of Sayyidina Abdullah ta'ala. and it's in then increased to 20 camels and again it's drawn in the name of Sayyidina Abdullah ta'ala. and then increased to 30 camels and again 
It's drawn in the name of Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala. Continuously. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then 100 camels. And this time, the lot is drawn in the name of the 100 camels. And so, in this manner, um, it is decided that as a, uh, an, as a compensation or to compensate for this sacrifice of Sayyidina Abdullah, 100 camels will be sacrificed and slaughtered um, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so uh, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he arranges for this sacrifice and once those camels are sacrificed, he announces that anyone may come and take as much of that meat as they want. Right? No restrictions. Anyone and any amount they can take with them. Even to the extent that he says that any animals and predatory uh, birds and so on that come should not be deprived. And this is something that uh, should remind you of uh, Sayyidina uh, Hashim and other forefathers of the Prophet ﷺ, regarding whom it was said that their spread, their dastarkhan was open even to animals and, and uh, predators. And so this is something that he said. After successfully completing this uh, sacrifice or getting through the stage of this uh, sacrifice, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib then feels that it is time that his, his beautiful son should be married and he should seek a bride for him, someone that is, you know, that, that, that can be in some way you know, equal to the beauty and the conduct that his son um, sort of possesses. And you know have the same or similar characteristics um, as as this beautiful son of his, and so the eye of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib falls onto a family in the tribe Banu Zuhra, in again in uh, Madina Munawwara, known you know as Yathrib at the time, and it is the leader of this tribe of Banu Zuhra of that time. Wahb bin Abd Munaf, who Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib arranges to go and see alongside his uh, alongside his son Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala and she's uh, called Amina Sayyida Tayyiba Tahira Sayyida Amina bint Wahb radiallahu ta'ala anha so he travels to his, uh, to his residence and seeks his daughter's hand in marriage for his son Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala. When this leader of this uh, tribe Banu Zuhra, he sees uh, you know, the great leader and remember being the leader of the Quraysh and custodian of the Kaaba and other such responsibilities was a prominent position that was admired and, and had prestige and honor associated with it throughout, throughout Arabia. And so the, when he saw Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, you know, the, the custodian of these responsibilities and the leader of the Quraysh coming to his home, um, there was no limit to his joy and his happiness. And he was... Uh, he was absolutely overjoyed and he immediately accepted this proposal and so very quickly um, the nikah was arranged between Sayyidina Abdullah and Sayyida Amina radiallahu ta'ala At the time Sayyidina Abdullah was 18 or 20 years old and he was in the prime of his youth. And on top of his astounding beauty, you had uh, the veil of, of amazing 
taqwa and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which you know which just made him that much more uh, handsome and beautiful and it, literally there were you know there were people who were sort of um, you know who were in a state like a fish out of water and how you see a fish out of water um, sort of uh, how it behaves <coughs> and the, the anxiety that it experiences uh, and in yearning for water there were people yearning in this manner just to catch a glimpse of this beauty of Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala and so this is why you know the historians and the ulama they've actually said Imam Zaini Dahlan Makki the the teacher and sh uh, sheikh of Imam Ahmad Raza rahimahullah ta'ala he writes in his seerah he says falaqiya Abdullah fi zamanihi min al-nisa'i min al-'ina'i mithla ma laqiya Yusuf fi zamanihi min imra'at al-'aziz he says that Sayyidina Abdullah radiyallahu ta'ala experienced the same trial through women in his time as was experienced by Yusuf alayhi salam um, through Zulekha in his, by, you know, in his time and by him. So he, he says that this is a similarity between uh, the experiences uh, of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam and those of Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala. And he also mentions, he says that وَفِي شَرْحِ mawahib in a commentary of Al Mawahib al Dunya, which is a world renowned uh, traditional uh, text on, on Sirah of the Prophet, he says in a commentary of that, it mentions that Ghana Yatala'u Nuran fi Quraysh. That Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala amongst the Quraysh, you know, he was someone who uh, who possessed a, a specific and a particular nur and light could be seen uh, sort of brightening his face. Wakana Ajmaluhum and he was the most handsome of all the Quraysh. Washagafat bihi Nisa Quraysh and the women of uh, the Quraysh, all of them had uh, uh, this wish and desire to be wed to Sayyidina. Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala wa kidna an tazhala uquluhunna and they uh, were so engrossed in this love of Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala that you know it, it, it would appear that they would soon they would lose their minds this is how it's described that uh, you know an tazhala uquluhunna that uh, they will they, it seemed as if they would lose their mind. This is how uh, engrossed they were. But Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala he responded in the same way as Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam and he <coughs> maintained his honor and dignity and his taqwa and piety and he did not gaze at them, not one. And so It, you know the, the way these women uh, presented themselves uh, to Sayyidina Abdullah and how they behaved it would appear as if it was the time of Yusuf salam once again there were many who made proposals for marriage and so on and they, many even that tried to um, you know, draw attention to themselves and there was one response from Sayyidina Abdullah and he said Ammal haramu fal mamatu dunahu wal hilla la hilla fastabina he said that as for haram as for that which is prohibited then I would rather die this is, I would rather die than do something which is haram. 
And so, you know, it tells you of the morals and the beliefs of the father of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he said, "Wal hilla la hilla fastabina." He said that um, as for halal, then I don't say I don't see any proof and evidence for what you are inviting me towards of being halal. فَكَيْفَ بِالْأَمْرِ الَّذِي تَبْغِينَ He said, how can, I, how can I accept the proposals that you are making? يَحْمِلْ كَرِيمُ إِرْضَهُ وَدِينَ He says that someone who is noble and honorable always protects his honor and dignity. So it is my responsibility to protect my honor and my dignity. Anyhow, um, Sayyidina... Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala as I mentioned was eventually married to Sayyida Amina radiallahu ta'ala anha and she travelled back with her father-in-law Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and her husband Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajmain. You know that Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib was a merchant by trade. And so it was, true, it was through his um, efforts that the Quraysh, the Meccans, had acquired a safe passage into Syria and Palestine and Yemen and other places where you know, he had made uh, pacts with the, their leaders and their kings and, and wrote to them and, and gone to see them and so on and set up safe passage for them to travel uh, to these places for the purpose of trade and they truly prospered because of this um, and so on one occasion um, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib he asked his son Sayyidina Abdullah ta'ala, to take his caravan um, and uh, under his own supervision uh, to Syria you know, for the purpose of trade. But once they'd completed their, uh, you know, their trade in Syria, they traveled back and the route was uh, via uh, Yathrib or uh, Madinat al Munawwara as we, as we know it. And on his arrival there, en route, he became ill. And so they stopped at Medina Munawwara and he stayed with his uh, maternal family and however his illness grew stronger and the others left he, he, he asked them to, to carry on that he would catch up with them once he'd recovered but his illness grew stronger and he passed away in uh, Medina Munawwara so he remained there for one month um, in the care of his uh, maternal uh, family after which he passed away and returned to Allah and Dala. When they all heard of news of his passing away everyone was, was, was shocked. Remember he was only uh, still very young at, at that age and everyone was shocked and was, was heartbroken but no one so no one like Sayyida Amina radiallahu ta'ala. Uh, it, it would be impossible to try to imagine her sorrow and what she felt having lost her husband so early uh, after you know being married to him. And then also the fact that I've described to you his physical and his internal beauty, his outer and inner beauty. You know, to lose somebody, to lose a husband um, of those qualities must have been uh, extremely painful and difficult. And there are even verses of poetry that are narrated by uh, many historians which describe her, her sorrow um, at the passing of her husband Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala. At this time, the Prophet وسلم, uh, was in the womb of his mother, Sayyida Amina 
رضی اللہ تعالی عنہ and so he became orphaned even before he was born and Imam Ahmad bin Zaini Dahlan Makki rahimahullah ta'ala again in his text Asiratun Nabawiya um, he writes he says that narrating from Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala an ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma qala lamma tuwafiya Abdullah qalatil malaika when Sayyidina Abdullah radiyallahu ta'ala an passed away the angels they said Ya ilahana wa sayyidana wa our Lord and our Master baqiya nabiyyuka yatiman la abalahu said your prophet, your messenger has become orphaned he doesn't have a father anymore and so the angels were you know, we, you can sense that even the angels were saddened by uh, this uh, this passing of Sayyidina Abdullah uh, and they were wondering as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to take away the Prophet sallallahu father even before uh, before he was born and this is a question that might have arose in your mind you, you know you, you might have wondered why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose to leave the Prophet sallallahu orphaned even before he was born and so one response to this is that uh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in to the angels as is mentioned in this hadith. وَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, لَهُمْ to the angels, أَنَا لَهُ حَافِظٌ وَنَسِينٌ I am his, uh, his guardian and his protector. So, you know, the, the, what, do, what are parents for? for they are there to, to protect their children and to look out for them and to make arrangements for them and so on. So, um, you know, in that sense, those responsibilities, you know, um, just, uh, you know, I, I'm certain that this would never sort of, uh, sort of come into or creep into anyone's mind, but there's no association of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a, as a parent or a guardian or a father more that these responsibilities that are normally undertaken uh, in this world by parents and so on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made arrangements for those himself right? and so um, meaning that the absence um, of uh, Sayyidina Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala would not mean that the Prophet وسلم, would be uh, deprived of that protection and that security that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would arrange for that. And Wafi Rewayatin, in one narration, it mentions that Ana Wali Yuhu. I am his, you know, Wali is a word which has uh, many meanings. It has, uh, you know, it's one of those Arabic words which has many, many meanings. And so in this context, we're looking at in terms of a, a guardian or protector or that kind of meaning. I am his, his, his protector, his wahafizuhu, and his, his guardian, and wahami, wa rabbuhu, wa awnuhu, wa radifuhu, wa kafihi. And so Allah said that I am his protector and I am his guardian and I will look out for him. I am his Lord and his help and his sustainer and I am sufficient for him I am sufficient for him and so send salutations upon him right? so the angels were instructed in this at this time when they were questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the loss of the Prophet father Allah instructed them to send salutations upon uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and Allah is telling the angels, He's saying, seek baraka, seek blessings, be ismihi with the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Send salutations upon him and seek blessings through his name. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands this for his angels, then surely you know, this is something that we can also, uh, and we should also, we must also seek blessing from by sending salutations upon the Prophet and 
by seeking barakah through his name. Salatu salamu alayka ya Sayyidi ya Rasulullah wa ala alika wa sahabika ya Sayyidi ya Habibullah. Imam uh, Zaini Dahlan Makki, he says that uh, he narrates from Sayyidina Imam Jafar As-Sadiq one of the Aima of the Ahlul Bayt um, he, he narrates and now that was a response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of um, the effect on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of losing his father and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, saying that this will, you know, this will not uh, there will be no uh, sort of uh, the Prophet would not be deprived in that sense uh, of, of, the, of that security and so on. But this is his perception of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made it so that the Prophet وسلم, was a yateem, he was an orphan uh, even before he was born. So, وَقِيلَ لِجَعْفَرِ الصَّادِقِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى It was said to Imam Jafar Sadiq رضي الله تعالى لما يتم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم why was the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم made an orphan أي ما حكمة ذلك in other words what is the hikma what's the wisdom behind the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم being made an orphan and so his response was he said قال لألا يكون عليه حق لمخلوق he said that one of the reasons that was, there are many reasons, and one of the reasons was so that no one has any right over the Prophet ﷺ, no one in the makhluk, in the creation, has a right over the Prophet ﷺ. And this is why his father passed away before his birth, and his mother passed away in his early childhood. And so he says, Well Muradu Al Hukuku Sabitatu Bahdal Bulubi. He says that I mean those rights which become incumbent upon someone once they become Balil. Right? So those rights towards their parents and so on that become incumbent upon somebody when they become Balil. Lianna Ummahu Matat wa Umuruhu Sitta to Sinin. Because even his mother passed away when the Prophet ﷺ was only six years old. That was one reason that he gave. He gives another reason. وَلِيَعْلَمَ أَنَّ الْعَزِيزَ مَنْ أَعَزَّهُ اللَّهِ He said that also another hikmah and wisdom behind this was to truly show and to demonstrate that Al-Aziz, you know, someone who is honorable and noble, respectable, this honor and dignity and respect, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, anna al-aziz man a'azzahullah. That aziz, the respected and dignified one, is only the one who Allah makes honorable and dignified. Wa anna quwwatahu, and that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa honor and his dignity and his strength, laysat min al aba it wasn't because of his father and, and mother. It wasn't uh, something that he inherited from them or wasn't something that had come uh, you know, off their backs. Laysat min al-aba wal ummahat. It wasn't because of his father's forefathers even and mother's wala min al-mal. And it wasn't because of wealth. Hmm? So this is why he was orphaned early on to show that his power, his honor, his dignity, everything that he had was in spite of losing his parents, one before his, the father, before his birth and mother at an early age. بَلْ قُوَّتُهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى But it was to demonstrate that his strength, his power, his uh, success, was directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third reason he said, وَأَيْدًا and also, لِيَرْحَمَ الْفَقِيرَ وَالْيَتِيمِ It was so that 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam could have direct empathy with orphans and the needy, right? being orphaned um, himself. And we see this as well. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took great care of orphans and of all who were needy. And the Sharia of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All of these reflect that to the extent that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, he even states that the majority of people from his, you know, uh, the majority of the residents of Jannah will be the poor and the needy and and so on, and and that he should be searched for amongst uh, such people. He accepted himself. He chose to live a life of uh, of humility, and you know, again, I would say. Um, look up the lectures on the Shamail on YouTube and listen to them, and learn about the humble, uh, you know, lifestyle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But I always say this. I said this in those lectures, and I say it again. You know, the one thing you remember is you don't associate poverty with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, I was, you know, and I'm very, very careful in terms of the wording that I use. And this humble and simple lifestyle that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam adopted, this was humility. It wasn't poverty. Poverty is an affliction. It's something that people have no control over. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had this choice, and he says himself that Allah subhanahu wa taala gave me the choice. He said, "You can have uh, kingship. You can have sovereignty with your prophethood, or you can choose." Uh, and and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I chose to be Nabiyun Abd. I so I chose to be a prophet of Allah, who is His servant, His Abd, and not a prophet who is a king." And so he, the Prophet sallam chose this status. He said, um, "The Prophet sallam said, if I if I wished, this mountain oh this huge mountain would turn to gold for me." Uh, and also to mention that it wasn't that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't receive. Vast and huge amounts of wealth, right? When 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 places like Bahrain and and so on, you know, they uh, they accepted, uh, you know, to live under the governance of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so on, and they paid their jizya, their taxes, and you know, huge amounts of wealth you, that you know are beyond your perception and imagination came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but it was a matter of it going. Quicker than it came. Yeah, it, it it came and it went quicker than it came, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, demonstrated his uh, his uh, sakha and his generosity in this manner. And so um, that's some reasons, that some answers, if that question's ever been in your mind, that some answers with reference to Sayyidina Imam Jafar as Sadiq radhiyallahu taala. One of the ayma of the Ahlul Bayt who explains very beautifully um, uh, how, why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam grew. So there's three, uh, just three reasons. There's no, there's other reasons as well, and also, you know, the wisdoms, the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa taala um, would be beyond our complete sort of comprehension and perception. But th this is just to explain, you know. Uh, one number one that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam yes you know it, it's difficult to to phrase correctly uh, you know to deliver correctly the the meaning but in terms of yes it was a huge loss and you know sayyida amina radiyallahu anha uh, would have felt this and then her loss as well and so on but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not let this affect the upbringing of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For example, another reason is part, you know, is part of the fact that orphans usually, when they are orphaned, and depending on the culture and so on, and especially the way things were at that time, you know, uh, their wealth was uh, was often taken from them. They were often deprived. They were brought up, you know, being deprived without a, uh, any sort of. Uh, Education without any uh, anyone looking after their physical and social well-being, because of which many you'll find fall into criminal activities, and they don't have you know that sound 
moral sort of upbringing that you'd expect from someone who has good parents to guide them, in spite of this, look at the conduct and the character of the Prophet sallallahu right? alaihi Absolutely remarkable, uncontested, the best creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala in every possible manner. And so, you know, that that's that, that's something else to contemplate. So there are there's many reasons. That's just, but they're all you know they, they, of this nature that it, it shows you. It is miraculous in itself, you know, the, the, the upbringing of the Prophet wasallam in such a manner. And you know how Allah SWT, this is something that we'll talk about at the relevant point when we talk about the early childhood of the Prophet wasallam. But I'll give you an example. When his, when his mother passed away, Sayyidah Amna radiallahu anha, he was brought back from um, Abawa, where she passed away, to Makkah by uh, his... Uh, uh, nurse or um, she was actually a servant of Sayyidah Amina radiallahu anha and so then by association she then continued to serve Rasulullah sallallahu look after him the Prophet sallallahu honoured her always you know like a mother spoke very fondly of her and you know whenever uh, I read about her when I hear about her when I talk about her my heart is filled with with emotions and affection, you know, for love for this for this woman who had the honor of you know, lo- looking after and nurturing the Prophet وسلم, through his uh, his childhood, and someone who the Prophet وسلم, spoke very fondly of and considered to be you know like a mother, see that Ummah anha. She brought the Prophet وسلم, back to Mecca. She looked after the Prophet وسلم, and there's a, a very beautiful narration about two Sahaba. She was a dark-skinned woman. And there's a very beautiful narration about two Sahaba who were quarreling. And one of them said to the other one, he sort of, uh, he, uh, he, he, he cursed him in a manner of speaking. And he said, Yabna Sauda. He said, you, he, he said, son of a black woman. He addressed him in that way. And the Prophet ﷺ got extremely angry. And he said, I am also the son of a black woman. And there he was talking about Umm Ayman, his, his uh, you know, this, this blessed and noble woman who, uh, who looked after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But anyhow, she narrates that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would wake up in the morning, and you know, like normally when you when you when when children wake up, I'm sure if you don't have children of your own, you know, you've seen other uh, children in the family and so on. When when small children when they wake up in the morning. You know, you can tell that they've been sleeping. Uh, often, you know, the the eyes and uh, and the hair and just the general look and so on. He said when the Prophet sallallahu would wake up in the morning, is absolutely as fresh as a as a, as a rose. You know, uh, the hair, the eyes, the facial expression, everything didn't need anything doing to him. Prophet sallallahu would often have a glass of you know have a have a drink of water for breakfast and that's it. He would just have some water and he and he'd go. Um, when they would eat, if the family of Sayyidina, uh, 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 you know, if the family ate without the Prophet وسلم, then they would remain hungry. The food wouldn't be enough to fill all of them. And so this is why the Prophet uncle, uncle Hazrat Abu Talib, uh, he would say to his family, wait for the Prophet وسلم, and encourage them to wait for him. And when, when he did join them, the same amount of food was always enough to fill everyone. These kind of things, you know, it shows you that in spite of the fact that the Prophet sallallahu was orphaned at uh, such an early age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, that, that statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what was it, you know, what did he say to the angels? He said to them, he said, Ana lahu hafizun wa nasir. I'm his helper and his guardian. You see that that's reflected in the upbringing of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And ana waliyuhu, wa hafizuhu, wa hamihi, wa rabbuhu, wa aunuhu, wa raziquhu, wa kafi. That I, I'm his, I'm his protector. I'm his guardian. I'm his helper. I'm his rabb, his lord, and his help. Wa raziquhu and his uh, sustainer, wa kafi, and I am sufficient for him. And we see that throughout the uh, sort of the upbringing of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so um, 
yes, many, many reasons, but um, you know, the, that, that in itself being a miracle, then added to that in terms of, remember, in, in the Prophet ﷺ being orphaned, and then, you know, arguably the greatest miracle of the Prophet ﷺ, according to many ulama, it is the greatest miracle of the Prophet ﷺ, is the Qur'an al Majid. The, the fact that he was orphaned, didn't, wasn't schooled, wasn't taught by anyone, and you know, in spite of all of this, the the Prophet sallallahu bringing the Quran, it just adds to to the greatness of that miracle. His superior morals and conduct. You know, uh, we could go on forever talking about the the, the conduct, the superior conduct and the morals of the Prophet ﷺ. and where did they all come from? This was direct uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So um, that's, a, that's a short response, um, perhaps maybe a lengthier response at some point. Just to wind up now, just to finish off a few minutes, last few minutes, um, the next topic we're going to discuss is the Iman of the parents of the Prophet I had hoped to make a start on this today, but uh, there's only a few minutes left, and I don't want to start something, and so I have to stop abruptly and then uh, start again. So just to give you a general overview of what's to come, inshallah, uh, what we'll be starting from from next week's lecture in terms of the iman and the belief of the parents of the Prophet And as I mentioned last time as well, this is something that I feel. Uh, very strongly about and very passionate about and you know the, the, the thing that always keeps coming to my mind is that how can you hope to achieve salvation yourself how can you hope that your parents will achieve salvation when you you know when you hold the belief that the Prophet Sallallahu parents won't right? and, and that's you know it really it's, a, it's an emotional point it's not academic or in that way but that's what seals it for me that, you know, how can you hope for any salvation at all for yourself or for your parents if you believe that the Prophet Sallallahu parents uh, won't achieve that salvation? Until recently, until very recently, the entire Ummah in, well, unanimously was in agreement upon the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu parents are Naji, that's an Arabic term. From coming from Nijat, which means salvation. So the Prophet Sallallahu's parents are Naji, they have acquired or will acquire salvation. That was a unanimous aqidah, you know, it was, uh, you can consider it as a, a consensus amongst the Ummah. It wasn't on the same, uh, you know, not everyone had the same evidence. There was different reasoning. There are three, uh, three separate beliefs, three separate camps. The result was the same. Right? Everyone had their own set of uh, sort of uh, evidences, but the result was the same. One view was that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's parents were ashab al fitra or ashab al fatra, people who lived in a time where for a long time there had been no prophet or messenger sent to those people. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he does not punish anyone until they've been given the opportunity to believe, therefore they will not be punished. So the result is the same, that they will not be punished, they will achieve salvation. The second view was that the parents of the Prophet ﷺ were believers. They were followers of the true Abrahamic religion and by religion I mean beliefs, the aqaid, the beliefs they held were the same that were given to uh, the children of Ismail salam from him, from Ibrahim salam and they were true followers of that religion, that faith. Although the details, the sharia, you know, perhaps may not have been around at that time but their beliefs were intact and by discussing all of these parents of Prophet one thing you will have seen is that you see very firmly those Abrahamic beliefs coming into play. 
right? uh, the strength of belief of uh, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and you know uh, Sayyidina Hashim and other forefathers of the Prophet وسلم, it's very very clear and so that was one view the result again the same if they are believers they will be successful the third view was that the Prophet Sallallahu parents were on request of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought back to life. They accepted Islam, believed in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were laid to rest again. And so they were believers. These were three different viewpoints and inshallah we'll be discussing all of them separately. We'll also be looking at those who now uh, don't sort of accept this, what their sort of uh, objections are and inshallah we'll be giving you uh, ample sort of uh, discussion uh, and answers to those uh, objections as well. We'll be looking at the objections in detail as well and also looking at the detailed analysis that many of our ulama have done. Uh, I'll be giving you uh, a list of those ulama who've actually written on this topic as well, a huge uh, list, but I'll be mentioning some prominent ulama who've written on this topic historically. So that's one thing to remember that you know, as, as, a, as an overview or as an introduction to this topic, if you like, that until recently, the whole Ummah was united in the belief that the parents of the Prophet Sallallahu are Naji and they are, you know, they have achieved salvation and success. It's only very recently that this uh, Aqidah has become disputed, but inshallah, we'll discuss in detail. Any questions? Zakallah, thank you for your attendance and inshallah I hope to see you again uh, same time quarter past seven uh, next week.